to send the text in advance and there was no chance to make copies. So in order to make up for it, I made some handouts. If anybody doesn't have one, they, I leave them here for you to, to have them. So that way you'll be able to follow at least what's the thread of what I'm trying to present here. Sorry. Um, I would like to start also by thanking Nuria Santa Madrid uh, and Blanca Rodriguez for, for their generosity in inviting us and, and letting us be part of this and also to all our <coughs> serving counterparts. I mean, uh, as I was saying this morning, that is just uh, the, the beginning of, of, of many, many more. So I won't, I won't, um, I won't take up more, more time. Um, what, I, what I would like to, to um, raise or, or articulate here today is that um, the idea of a certain rehumanization of critical theory. What's happened in the past two decades, the notion of the, of the human has returned to the discourses and theories of a number of post-foundational and critical thinkers, thinkers that uh, align themselves with the tenets of anti-humanism. So what's happened uh, for this rehumanization to take place? And I'm going to explore this through, through two concrete examples, those of Etienne Balibar and um, um, that of Judith Butler. But before I, I go into detail, or as much detail as I can go into in this format, th um, about the notions of the human that Butler and Balibar develop, I would like to outline the map of the problem that I'm trying to address. That is, what are the reasons, or what would be some of the reasons behind um, the 20th century anti-humanism, and what are the reasons, or what are some of the reasons behind the 21st century new humanism, although I'm not sure we should call it a humanism, but at least what are the reasons behind this uh, rehumanization of, of theory and political theory. So the first part of the paper is uh, entitled From All to Human to Not Human Enough. And as you can see in the handout, what I'm going to do is compare and contrast three reasons that are actually running parallel in, in both these strategies. The second half of the 20th century, uh, specifically in the French context but not limited to it, bore witness to what seemed an irre irreversible abandonment of the concept of the human. This approach uh, received a label of anti-humanism. What are the reasons behind this anti-humanism? I would like to focus on three. The first one, uh, in the hand of its 20th century events, I would call the barbaric historical events of the 20th century. Wars, genocide, mass destruction, and so on. And these events, especially in a conception of the human that took progress for granted, and took uh, um, improvement for granted, the, sac the signified human and all its derivatives turned into a synonym of brutality. The human was not an anymore that bitter of progress um, and reason and enlightenment, but um, the author of uh, the most extreme brutality, to the extent that giving it up, giving up the signifier of the human, seemed an inexorable necessity and an ethical commitment. It was ethically called for to give up, give up the notion of the human. The second one, the second reason would have to do with um, the battle that philosophy and political theory initiated against the dictatorship of identity, nature, essence and substance, which were taken up until then as unquestioned grounds. So if identity was something that was imposing on nature or essence, something that was imposing a norm, a pattern, uh, was homogenizing the, the population, um, the emancipatory project passed um, through a vindication of difference. <coughs> difference would have been suffocated by identities, obliterated by the empire of identity, and it needed to be released, it needed to be taken um, back from the margins into the center. So identity was uh, thus understood to engender exclusions. Every time there was a pattern, there were a lot of, uh, there were certain populations that wouldn't um, fit with that pattern. And a difference would be uh, what um, would call for inclusion. The other point of this critique of identities was that they claimed that they were universal when in reality more often than not they were particular, they were um, limited to, for example, male, the, human, the notion of human being was limited to male, heterosexual, western, white, etc. So the category of the human collapsed because there was no commonality or common essence to it 
and this gave rise to anti-humanism. The same move, the same critique of identities took place in the realm of politics with what has been called uh, identity politics. Um, during the 60s and the 70s, identity politics was um, very, um, had a lot of success, um, but it had a certain number of assumptions that made that during the 80s, this notion of identity uh, <coughs> was challenged and disputed. Some of those assumptions were that uh, there should be a certain common identity as a ground for collective politics. There would be an identity or a pre-existing subject that would prop political action. One of those examples is, first we need there to be women uh, if we want to articulate feminism. So the critiques against identity politics, had, uh, well, um, maybe this category, this subjective category of women is a result, is a, an effect, a construction of the very movement that is claiming to represent them. So there was a critique of the notion of identity also in the realm of uh, political theory. The third reason would be, um, for, for anti-humanism, would be a specific critique of society. So this critique of identity, this critique of nature, of essence, uh, was a critique linked to a very specific social uh, situation, that is, um, Foucault in, in Surveillere et Punir, which was translated as Discipline and Punishment, and for him, he, he agreed upon this title because of the importance of the notion of discipline. He spoke here in this book of the disciplinary societies, as societies that would inflict a strong norm or discipline under a form of regulations, uh, normally um, within closed institutions. So, well, these disciplinary societies <coughs> were raised during the 18th and 19th century and reached their height at the outset of the 20th century. In the past century, consumerist and mass societies, or this economy, adopted on a new basis the same principle of disciplinary societies, that is, homogenization and normalization. These institutions, these societies would homogenize, would normalize, that is, would function under the assumption of a certain principle of identity. All citizens should comply to certain goals, buy the car X, live in the X neighborhood, uh, work for X company, and uh, it would shape the, the citizen itself, the being of that citizen, what, what, what the ideal citizen was. So the claims of difference in this context aim to render visible everything that was left outside the standard, everything that wouldn't comply to this mass consumerism, to this discipline, etc. So the critique of the human and of identities in this 20th century in general portrayed itself as irreversible, as something that would have no uh, return and there was no need to return and no desire to return to, to those notions of nature, essence, identity or the human. Uh, Foucault's famous metaphor of the face drawn in the sun disappearing uh, with the sea uh, seemed to imply this so. However, there has been a comeback of the human in, in the past 20, 30 years. And that's what I would like to explore, this rehumanization of political theory. In general, political theorists speak of an ontological turn, and it's very, it's very interesting that they call it ontological, when in reality they mean anthropological. I'm thinking, for example, of Stephen White in his book Sustaining Affirmation. Um, he, he coins this idea of an ontological turn in political theory. Uh, he opposes it to other political theorists who wouldn't want to have ontological commitments. They speak of the citizen or they speak of freedom, but they don't want to enter into what they call metaphysical assumptions. And then um, this ontological turn would be, according to White, a questioning and a reconceptualization of human being in relation to its world. So that's why I think it should be called an anthropological turn. The human that returns is, however, not the essential, universal, and natural human, but rather what Stephen White um, names following Gianni Vattimo, a weak ontology or a weak anthropology. It's a weak human, a post-foundational human. So what are the reasons for this post-foundational anthropology? The general one, Stephen Wider and Oliver Marchart um, have talked about it, is that there would be a, the necessity um, of a certain form of identity in order to articulate political agency. We cannot just keep do away with without um, identity. Identity would be something both impossible and indispensable. However, I would like to explore three more specific reasons that would parallel the three reasons that I've just explained uh, with reference to anti-humanism. 
The first, um, the first reason has to do again with the events or, the, or with the current conjuncture. So while there are a number of 20th century events that can be easily be pointed at and denounced as brutal, brutality in the 21st century has taken more dispersed and all pervasive forms and even invisible. This brutality, this violence is being, we were talking about this this morning, is being normalized and it's not even being acknowledged. Uh, where Ballinger speaks to describe the situation of an extreme violence. And Butler started to talk two decades ago about extreme precarity. Balibar describes the current conjuncture of the world as being fundamentally different from that of the anti-humanist period. In particular, he defines extreme violence, and I think the uh, definition is here, uh, in point one to one, Ex extreme violence is an excessive development to which no symmetric counterpower or counterviolence can be opposed that not, does not disseminate and worsen it. And the example he puts it, uh, of it, one of them, is the war on terror. Butler, on her part, analyzes the effects of this extreme violence through the notion of precarity, that is, the political induced differential distribution of vulnerability or the different exposure to violence and death across populations. According to her, and this quote is also in the handout, precarity is not a passing or episodic condition, but a new form of regulation that distinguishes this historical time, this conjuncture. <coughs> precarity has itself become a regime, a hegemonic model of being governed and governing ourselves. So precarity is not a contingent situation that will eventually recede or wheel away. Precarity is a permanent mode of life, at least in these neoliberal societies, a new form of power and potential for exploitation. It is a continuous process of always increasing precarization. In this scenario, whether we describe it as, a, as one of extreme violence or one of extreme precarity, the appeal to the notion of human reveals itself no longer as an essentialist and anachronist bur burden, but as an effective resource to raise a barrier against the threats of unlivability, to set up limits to violence. So the human is called upon, not as an ontological uh, strong uh, notion, but as a political resource to come to respond to this extreme violence and extreme precarity. Second reason for the rehumanization would be um, the alteration in the logic of emancipation. What does it mean? How does emancipation work in this context? Um, emancipation is altered from what happened in the situation of anti-humanism, altered or even fully reversed. But because in the 20th century, emancipation worked by denouncing and dismantling identities. We would want to <coughs> set free from identities, from identitarian categories. Uh, because it would impose strict norms, models, or patterns of recognizability. But in the 21st century, emancipation no longer fights against, against the principle of recognition, against identity, but uh, is articulated through recognition and identity itself. Those who are not recognized as human are exposed to the, to the most extreme precarity and to the most extreme unlivability. Or in other words, the violence inflicted by identities or by recognition, the violence inflicted by the act of recognition, is only a small price to pay in comparison to the violence that can result from not being recognized, from not <coughs> counting. The third reason would again be a critique of society. We no longer live in disciplinary societies, we no longer live in mass consumer societies, we live in following Foucault and Wendy Brown, basically neoliberal societies. And precarity is indeed a neoliberal form of regulation.